Chapter Forty Four of the Mayor of Casterbridge by Thomas Hardy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bruce Peary. Chapter Forty Four. Meanwhile, the man of their talk had pursued his solitary way eastward till weariness overtook him, and he looked about for a place of rest his heart was so exacerbated at parting from the girl that he could not face an inn or even a household of the most humble kind and entering a field he lay down under a wheat-rick feeling no want of food the very heaviness of his soul caused him to sleep profoundly the bright autumn sun shining into his eyes across the stubble awoke him the next morning early he opened his basket and ate for his breakfast what he had packed for his supper and in doing so overhauled the remainder of his kit although everything he brought necessitated carriage at his own back he had secreted among his tools a few of elizabeth jane's cast-off belongings in the shape of gloves shoes a scrap of her handwriting and the like and in his pocket he carried a curl of her hair having looked at these things he closed them up again and went onward during five consecutive days henchard's rush basket rode along upon his shoulder between the highway hedges the new yellow of the rushes catching the eye of an occasional field labourer as he glanced through the quickset together with the wayfarer's hat and head and downturned face over which the twig shadows moved in endless procession it now became apparent that the direction of his journey was waden priors which he reached on the afternoon of the sixth day the renowned hill whereon the annual fair had been held for so many generations was now bare of human beings and almost of aught besides a few sheep grazed thereabout but these ran off when henchard halted upon the summit he deposited his basket upon the turf and looked about with sad curiosity till he discovered the road by which his wife and himself had entered on the upland so memorable to both five and twenty years before yes we came up that way he said after ascertaining his bearings she was carrying the baby and i was reading a ballot sheet then we crossed about here she so sad and weary and i speaking to her hardly at all because of my cursed pride and mortification at being poor then we saw the tent that must have stood more this way he walked to another spot it was not really where the tent had stood but it seemed so to him here we went in and here we sat down i faced this way then i drank and committed my crime it must have been just on that very pixie ring that she was standing when she said her last words to me before going off with him i can hear their sound now and the sound of her sobs oh mike i've lived with thee all this while and had nothing but temper now i'm no more to ee i'll try my luck elsewhere he experienced not only the bitterness of a man who finds in looking back upon an ambitious course that what he has sacrificed in sentiment was worth as much as what he has gained in substance but the superadded bitterness of seeing his very recantation nullified he had been sorry for all this long ago but his attempts to replace ambition by love had been as fully foiled as his ambition itself his wronged wife had foiled them by a fraud so grandly simple as to be almost a virtue it was an odd sequence that out of all this tampering with social law came that flower of nature elizabeth part of his wish to wash his hands of life arose from his perception of its contrarious inconsistencies of nature's jaunty readiness to support unorthodox social principles he intended to go on from this place visited as an act of penance into another part of the country altogether but he could not help thinking of elizabeth and the quarter of the horizon in which she lived out of this it happened that the centrifugal tendency imparted by weariness of the world was counteracted by the centripetal influence of his love for his stepdaughter 
as a consequence instead of following a straight course yet further away from casterbridge henchard gradually almost unconsciously deflected from that right line of his first intention till by degrees his wandering like that of the canadian woodsman became part of a circle of which casterbridge formed the centre in ascending any particular hill he ascertained the bearings as nearly as he could by means of the sun moon or stars and settled in his mind the exact direction in which casterbridge and elizabeth jane lay sneering at himself for his weakness he yet every hour nay every few minutes conjectured her actions for the time being her sitting down and rising up her goings and comings till thought of nuisance and farfrae's counter influence would pass like a cold blast over a pool and efface her image and then he would say to himself oh you fool all this about a daughter who is no daughter of thine at length he obtained employment at his own occupation of hay trusser work of that sort being in demand at this autumn time the scene of his hiring was a pastoral farm near the old western highway whose course was the channel of all such communications as passed between the busy centres of novelty and the remote wessex boroughs he had chosen the neighbourhood of this artery from a sense that situated here though at a distance of fifty miles he was virtually nearer to her whose welfare was so dear than he would be at a roadless spot only half as remote and thus henchard found himself again on the precise standing which he had occupied a quarter of a century before externally there was nothing to hinder his making another start on the upward slope and by his new lights achieving higher things than his soul in its half-formed state had been able to accomplish but the ingenious machinery contrived by the gods for reducing human possibilities of amelioration to a minimum which arranges that wisdom to do shall come pari passu with the departure of zest for doing stood in the way of all that he had no wish to make an arena a second time of a world that had become a mere painted scene to him very often as his hay knife crunched down among the sweet-smelling grassy stems he would survey mankind and say to himself here and everywhere be folk dying before their time like frosted leaves though wanted by their families the country and the world while i an outcast an encumberer of the ground wanted by nobody and despised by all live on against my will he often kept an eager ear upon the conversation of those who passed along the road not from a general curiosity by any means but in the hope that among these travellers between casterbridge and london some would sooner or later speak of the former place the distance however was too great to lend much probability to his desire and the highest result of his attention to wayside words was that he did indeed hear the name casterbridge uttered one day by the driver of a road wagon henchard ran to the gate of the field he worked in and hailed the speaker who was a stranger yes i've come from there maister he said in answer to henchard's inquiry i trade up and down ye know though what with this travelling without horses that's getting so common my work will soon be done anything moving in the old place mid i ask all the same as usual i've heard that mr farfrae the late mayor is thinking of getting married now is that true or not i couldn't say for the life of me oh no i should think not but yes john you forget said a woman inside the wagon tilt what were them packages we carried there at the beginning of the week surely they said a wedding was coming off soon on martin's day the man declared he remembered nothing about it and the wagon went on jangling over the hill henchard was convinced that the woman's memory served her well the date was an extremely probable one there being no reason for delay on either side he might for that matter write and inquire of elizabeth but his instinct for sequestration had made the course difficult 
yet before he left her she had said that for him to be absent from her wedding was not as she wished it to be the remembrance would continually revive in him now that it was not elizabeth and farfrae who had driven him away from them but his own haughty sense that his presence was no longer desired he had assumed the return of newson without absolute proof that the captain meant to return still less that elizabeth jane would welcome him and with no proof whatever that if he did return he would stay what if he had been mistaken in his views if there had been no necessity that his own absolute separation from her he loved should be involved in these untoward incidents to make one more attempt to be near her to go back to see her to plead his cause before her to ask forgiveness for his fraud to endeavor strenuously to hold his own in her love it was worth the risk of repulse ay of life itself but how to initiate this reversal of all his former resolves without causing husband and wife to despise him for his inconsistency was a question which made him tremble and brood he cut and cut his trusses two days more and then he concluded his hesitancies by a sudden reckless determination to go to the wedding festivity neither writing nor message would be expected of him she had regretted his decision to be absent his unanticipated presence would fill the little unsatisfied corner that would probably have place in her just heart without him to intrude as little of his personality as possible upon a gay event with which that personality could show nothing in keeping he decided not to make his appearance till evening when stiffness would have worn off and a gentle wish to let bygones be bygones would exercise its sway in all hearts he started on foot two mornings before st martin's tide allowing himself about sixteen miles to perform for each of the three days journey reckoning the wedding day as one there were only two towns melchester and shotsford of any importance along his course and at the latter he stopped on the second night not only to rest but to prepare himself for the next evening possessing no clothes but the working suit he stood in now stained and distorted by their two months of hard usage he entered a shop to make some purchases which should put him externally at any rate a little in harmony with the prevailing tone of the morrow a rough yet respectable coat and hat a new shirt and neckcloth were the chief of these and having satisfied himself that in appearance at least he would not now offend her he proceeded to the more interesting particular of buying her some present what should that present be he walked up and down the street regarding dubiously the display in the shop windows from a gloomy sense that what he might most like to give her would be beyond his miserable pocket at length a caged goldfinch met his eye the cage was a plain and small one the shop humble and on inquiry he concluded he could afford the modest sum asked a sheet of newspaper was tied round the little creature's wire prison and with the wrapped-up cage in his hand henchard sought a lodging for the night next day he set out upon the last stage and was soon within the district which had been his dealing ground in bygone years part of the distance he travelled by carrier seating himself in the darkest corner at the back of that trader's van and as the other passengers mainly women going short journeys mounted and alighted in front of henchard they talked over much local news not the least portion of this being the wedding then in course of celebration at the town they were nearing it appeared from their accounts that the town band had been hired for the evening party and lest the convivial instincts of that body should get the better of their skill the further step had been taken of engaging the string band from budmouth so that there would be a reserve of harmony to fall back upon in case of need he heard however but few particulars beyond those known to him already 
the incident of the deepest interest on the journey being the soft pealing of the casterbridge bells which reached the traveller's ears while the van paused on the top of yalbury hill to have the drag lowered the time was just after twelve o'clock those notes were a signal that all had gone well that there had been no slip twixt cup and lip in this case that elizabeth jane and donald farfrae were man and wife henchard did not care to ride any further with his chattering companions after hearing this sound indeed it quite unmanned him and in pursuance of his plan of not showing himself in casterbridge street till evening lest he should mortify farfrae and his bride he alighted here with his bundle and bird-cage and was soon left as a lonely figure on the broad white highway it was the hill near which he had waited to meet farfrae almost two years earlier to tell him of the serious illness of his wife lucetta the place was unchanged the same larches sighed the same notes but farfrae had another wife and as henchard knew a better one he only hoped that elizabeth jane had obtained a better home than had been hers at the former time he passed the remainder of the afternoon in a curious high-strung condition unable to do much but think of the approaching meeting with her and sadly satirize himself for his emotions thereon as a samson shorn such an innovation on casterbridge customs as a flitting of bridegroom and bride from the town immediately after the ceremony was not likely but if it should have taken place he would wait till their return to assure himself on this point he asked a market man when near the borough if the newly married couple had gone away and was promptly informed that they had not they were at that hour according to all accounts entertaining a houseful of guests at their home in corn street henchard dusted his boots washed his hands at the riverside and proceeded up the town under the feeble lamps he need have made no inquiries beforehand for on drawing near farfrae's residence it was plain to the least observant that festivity prevailed within and that donald himself shared it his voice being distinctly audible in the street giving strong expression to a song of his dear native country that he loved so well as never to have revisited it idlers were standing on the pavement in front and wishing to escape the notice of these henchard passed quickly on to the door it was wide open the hall was lighted extravagantly and people were going up and down the stairs his courage failed him to enter footsore laden and poorly dressed into the midst of such resplendency was to bring needless humiliation upon her he loved if not to court repulse from her husband accordingly he went round into the street at the back that he knew so well entered the garden and came quietly into the house through the kitchen temporarily depositing the bird and cage under a bush outside to lessen the awkwardness of his arrival solitude and sadness had so emoliated henchard that he now feared circumstances he would formerly have scorned and he began to wish that he had not taken upon himself to arrive at such a juncture however his progress was made unexpectedly easy by his discovering alone in the kitchen an elderly woman who seemed to be acting as provisional housekeeper during the convulsions from which farfrae's establishment was just then suffering she was one of those people whom nothing surprises and though to her a total stranger his request must have seemed odd she willingly volunteered to go up and inform the master and mistress of the house that a humble old friend had come on second thought she said that he had better not wait in the kitchen but come up into the little back parlour which was empty he thereupon followed her thither and she left him just as she got across the landing to the door of the best parlour a dance was struck up and she returned to say that she would wait till that was over before announcing him mr and mrs farfrae having both joined in the figure the door of the front room had been taken off its hinges to give more space and that of the room henchard sat in being ajar 
he could see fractional parts of the dancers whenever their gyrations brought them near the doorway chiefly in the shape of the skirts of dresses and streaming curls of hair together with about three-fifths of the band in profile including the restless shadow of a fiddler's elbow and the tip of the bass viol bow the gaiety jarred upon henchard's spirits and he could not quite understand why farfrae a much sobered man and a widower who had had his trials should have cared for it all notwithstanding the fact that he was quite a young man still and quickly kindled to enthusiasm by dance and song that the quiet elizabeth who had long ago appraised life at a moderate value and who knew in spite of her maidenhood that marriage was as a rule no dancing matter should have had zest for this revelry surprised him still more however young people could not be quite old people he concluded and custom was omnipotent with the progress of the dance the performers spread out somewhat and then for the first time he caught a glimpse of the once despised daughter who had mastered him and made his heart ache she was in a dress of white silk or satin he was not near enough to say which snowy white without a tinge of milk or cream and the expression of her face was one of nervous pleasure rather than of gaiety presently farfrae came round his exuberant scotch movement making him conspicuous in a moment the pair were not dancing together but henchard could discern that whenever the chances of the figure made them the partners of a moment their emotions breathed a much subtler essence than at other times by degrees henchard became aware that the measure was trod by some one who out farfrayed farfray in saltatory intenseness this was strange and it was stranger to find that the eclipsing personage was elizabeth jane's partner the first time that henchard saw him he was sweeping grandly round his head quivering and low down his legs in the form of an x and his back towards the door the next time he came round in the other direction his white waistcoat preceding his face and his toes preceding his white waistcoat that happy face henchard's complete discomfiture lay in it it was nuisance who had indeed come and supplanted him henchard pushed to the door and for some seconds made no other movement he rose to his feet and stood like a dark ruin obscured by the shade from his own soul upthrown but he was no longer the man to stand these reverses unmoved his agitation was great and he would fain have been gone but before he could leave the dance had ended the housekeeper had informed elizabeth jane of the stranger who awaited her and she entered the room immediately oh it is mr henchard she said starting back what elizabeth he cried as he seized her hand what do you say mr henchard don't don't scourge me like that call me worthless old henchard anything but don't he be so cold as this oh my maid i see you have another a real father in my place then you know all but don't give all your thought to him do ye save a little room for me she flushed up and gently drew her hand away i could have loved you always i would have gladly she said but how can i when i know you have deceived me so so bitterly deceived me you persuaded me that my father was not my father allowed me to live on in ignorance of the truth for years and then when he my warm-hearted real father came to find me cruelly sent him away with the wicked invention of my death which nearly broke his heart oh how can i love as i once did a man who has served us like this henchard's lips half parted to begin an explanation but he shut them up like a vice and uttered not a sound how should he there and then set before her with any effect the palliatives of his great faults that he had himself been deceived in her identity at first till informed by her mother's letter that his own child had died 
that in the second accusation his lie had been the last desperate throw of a gamester who loved her affection better than his own honour among the many hindrances to such a pleading not the least was this that he did not sufficiently value himself to lessen his sufferings by strenuous appeal or elaborate argument waiving therefore his privilege of self-defence he regarded only his discomposure don't ye distress yourself on my account he said with proud superiority i would not wish it at such a time too as this i have done wrong in coming to ye i see my error but it is only for once so forgive it i'll never trouble ye again elizabeth jane no not to my dying day good night good bye then before she could collect her thoughts henchard went out from her rooms and departed from the house by the back way as he had come and she saw him no more end of chapter forty four